Uncharted The Lost Legacy proves two things about the Uncharted series. One, Uncharted games do not need Nathan Drake. Two, Uncharted games do need a complete overhaul from the ground up. I love most of the characters in this series. I love the writing, which is largely unparalleled in the video game industry, and I love going on adventures with Nate and co. But I can't play another game like this, not for a while at least. The formula is stale and desperately needs a shake-up. Despite all that negativity though, I'm giving The Lost Legacy 4 stars out of 5. As always, there's a full written review available on my website with a link in the description if you'd just like a spoiler-free summary. For much of the game, The Lost Legacy felt more like a 3 out of 5, albeit a lavishly produced one. There were long stretches where I felt like I was going through the motions, however the ending made up for that with probably the best set piece in an Uncharted game. 3 out of 5 would have been an overreaction. I'd be punishing the game for my own fatigue with the series, which isn't entirely fair. It's not entirely unfair either, mind you, but it's not the Lost Legacy's fault that I insisted on playing Uncharted 4 three and a half times to get the Platinum. Overall, there's just too much quality in here to justify a 3 out of 5, however you're still going to hear a lot of negativity in this video. I apologise if it comes across as overly harsh. The negativity comes in two forms. Some of it is directed specifically at the Lost Legacy, while the rest is directed at the series as a whole. I've not done a video on the Uncharted series before because most of my criticism has already been covered elsewhere. If you want to watch excellent critiques on the first four games, then check out the videos by Nova Canoe and Joseph Anderson. I'll link to their channels in the description, although there's a good chance you've already heard of them if you're watching this. Nova Canoe absolutely nails the problems of the combat in these games, and I completely agree with his conclusion that the games are often more fun on the lower difficulty settings. While I'm not going into detail on the previous four main entries, a summary of what I liked and disliked about those games is probably a good idea to add some context. This chart is a bit rough and ready, but I'm going from memory here, not scores I originally applied to these games back in the day. The best feature of Uncharted games is what I'm describing as the characters, although it's perhaps more accurate to say it's a combination of the dialogue and the excellent delivery from the likes of Nolan North, Emily Rose, Troy Baker, Richard McGonagall and Claudia Black. The scene in Uncharted 4 where Nate and Elena sit down and eat dinner felt like a real conversation between actual human beings. It's not laugh out loud funny or particularly clever, but it's genuine and that's so rare in video games. How it's rare in television and movies these days. Nate's sarcastic as all hell, which is tough to pull off in a video game. I still smile when I think of him screaming out his safe word when fighting with Nadine. Okay, mango, mango. What are you on about? Oh, it's my safe word. Then there's the random chatter while you play. This type of dialogue typically feels like it's added in at the last minute without much thought being put into it. Not in Uncharted games though. You won't block it out or ignore it. You'll wish you were there with them, joining in the conversation. It's also self-referential without beating you over the head with it. Second is the stories, which I consider to be fairly good with the usual caveat for a video game. Maybe it's more accurate to say I enjoy the adventure rather than the story. The stories are largely improving with each entry, except I might swap Uncharted 2 and 3. Uncharted 4 has the best story and I was relieved to see it move away from the supernatural nonsense which I've never been a fan of. Next is the exploration, and by that I'm talking about climbing, swinging, jumping and sliding on your ass. This has gotten better with each game, although again, the difference between 2 and 3 is slight. While it has improved, it's still not actually great. There's often little to no risk of death, and if you do die it'll be more than likely due to misreading the environmental clues rather than lacking the skill to perform the action. The gradual improvement is appreciated, but the first Uncharted game was released in 2007, and we're now in 2017. The Lost Legacy is the fifth Uncharted game I've played, plus there are similar games out there now, such as the rebooted Tomb Raider series. I know that objectively the exploration is getting better, but it doesn't feel that way because it's simultaneously getting stale. I wouldn't say it's bad though. I reserve that criticism for the game's combat. Again, it's gotten better as the series has matured, but it feels like how a child gets better at sport between the ages of 4 and 10. They've definitely improved and deserve a pat on the back for their achievements, but they aren't ready to be thrown into the defensive line of an NFL team. They're going to get hurt when they play against the pros. There's a long way to go before Uncharted's combat can be described as good or great. Given this list of my preferences, The Lost Legacy was always going to struggle to get my blood pumping. My favourite part of the game is the characters, and the main ones aren't in this game. The Lost Legacy is also shorter than all except the first game, which suggests the story is going to be less interesting. That's not quite how it panned out though. This video will be a mixture of commentary and critique, and as such it will obviously contain full spoilers. There might also be a few Uncharted 4 spoilers in there as well. The first part of this video leans heavily towards commentary as opposed to critique, because the game starts slowly with lots of drawn out tutorials. We start with Chloe Fraser shopping at a market in India. Chloe played a large role in Uncharted 2 and a smaller role in Uncharted 3, and she's bloody brilliant. She hooked up with Nate at one point, but they went their separate ways after the second game when he reunited with Elena. 
She haggles with a young girl who is looking after her father's stall. The girl takes a shine to Chloe's small Ganesh figure. There's a brief history lesson where Chloe mentions the story of how Ganesh fought Parashurama to defend his father Shiva's honour. Ganesh got his tusk cut off in the process and with that we have the explanation for this game's MacGuffin hunt. You're after Ganesh's tusk. The girl, Minu, offers to guide Chloe around the market and even tries to steal the Ganesh statue. I guess the stuff she's selling isn't all that valuable because she completely abandons the stall. Chloe wants to sneak on board a truck but Minu tells her it's dangerous and that people aren't allowed to cross the bridge. Chloe insists on going anyway so Minu creates a distraction and Chloe sneaks onto the truck. When you make it to the other side you're in a war zone. There's great environmental storytelling with citizens dashing back into their homes and a man being taken away on suspicion of being a spy. If you try and get close to the soldiers they will push you away. If you try three times they will shoot you dead. It's a nice touch as I was expecting them to just keep pushing me back forever. Chloe has to make it to a red door. You're forced to walk slowly through the streets until you reach a checkpoint. You're searched and questioned until a call comes in from a man named Asav who calls the guards away. There's a tiny bit of stealth before you make it to the red door. We're introduced to a new lockpicking mechanic which requires turning the left analog stick until you reach a vibration point and holding it there for a few seconds. You do this either two or three times depending on the lock, and you'll likely be fed up with this by the time you've finished opening the first lock. Chloe is here to meet someone at the Pink Lotus. She moves through a building where you get a few more opportunities to do basic stealth, or if you're like me, you'll make a complete mess of it and resort to a fist fight with the rebels who are trying to start an uprising in the city. You make it to the roof just in time to see the city getting bombed. This is the Indian army attempting to take out the rebels and it looks like they have a relaxed attitude towards collateral damage. Chloe is caught on the roof and ends up in another fight until she's joined by Nadine, the woman you are here to meet. In case you didn't play Uncharted 4, Nadine was in charge of a private military group called Shoreline. Shoreline worked with the Uncharted 4 villain, Rafe, to help him hunt Avery's treasure which Nate and his brother Sam were also chasing. In other words, Nadine provided all the bullet fodder that you spent 15 hours shooting. She's also a terrible character, or at least she was in Uncharted 4. She had little in the way of personality to speak of, she would just occasionally show up and be miserable. I have an ex-girlfriend who used to do that and let's just say there's a reason she's my ex-girlfriend. It's no coincidence that the first time Nadine speaks it's to complain. She whinges at Chloe for being late, for not being professional, for messing up her plans to track down Asav and for taking unnecessary risks, all in the space of about 10 seconds. You're late Fraser, what the hell was that? I thought you were a professional, me weeks to track down Asav, be foolish to take unnecessary risks. We. Oui. Chloe doesn't take this crap and makes it clear that she's calling the shots, thank god. They locate Asav's base camp and take a route via the rooftops to get there. We get a roof jumping tutorial which is unfortunately your only chance to take in the backdrop of this glorious city. I'd love to have spent more time here. The streets are a war zone so it would have been great to get in amongst the action. It's not like there would have been a shortage of guns and people to shoot with them. Naughty Dog gets a bit self referential by making a joke about the overuse of crates in Uncharted 4 and Nadine and Chloe promise not to use them again. Chloe tries to pick a lock to get into Asav's place but Nadine has a quicker method. Asaf has quite the collection of rare and presumably stolen artifacts. Chloe finds a picture of the tusk which is stuck to a map of the Hoysalar territory where the tusk is believed to be located. Asav and Chloe are after the same thing. Chloe then finds a disc locked up in a safe just before Asav bursts in with some soldiers to catch them in the act. Asav already knows Nadine but we don't know much about their relationship yet. Asav mentions that Shoreline is under new management and Nadine insists that it's only temporary. Chloe tries to get Asav on board by pretending to be impressed that Asav has found the Hoysalar territory. At least, I assume she's pretending. Nadine suspects that Chloe is trying to sell her out but it looks like she's just trying to buy some time. Chloe offers her services as an expert in the Hoysalar but Asav isn't interested. He already has an expert on his team. Plus, despite being the head of a militia that is taking his country into civil war, he looks down his nose at Chloe for being a thief who is exploiting India's problems. He says all this while surrounded by treasure of his own but I guess he's looking after it so that's okay? I'm English so I know all about looking after other countries antiques, it's not stealing, honest. Asav gets a call notifying him that all his men at the Pink Lotus have been taken out. He says he'll be right there as if the situation is urgent. I must be missing something here, presumably the men in question were the ones taken out by Nadine and Chloe a moment ago. He must know that because he wasn't surprised to see Chloe and Nadine when he walked into the room. So why is he dashing off to deal with the issue? He has the culprits in front of him. I guess he might need to put more men on security but he can deal with that remotely. Shouldn't he deal with Chloe and Nadine first? Anyway, Chloe and Nadine create a disturbance and jump through the window leading to a decent rooftop chase scene where they end up in a river. You rejoin them in a boat heading towards the Hoysala territory. 
Chloe and Nadine already knew where the Hoysala territory was located, so they didn't need the map from Asav, they just needed the disc and to solve the puzzle on the disc. Chloe fiddles around with the disc a bit and discovers three symbols. Ganesh's trident, Parashrama's bow and arrow, and Shiva's axe. So it's a case of find the symbols, find the tusk. Chloe credits her father for her knowledge of Hindu myths. You can expect to hear constant references to Chloe's father as the game progresses. When we regain control of Chloe, we're prompted to take a photo of the scenery on her smartphone. Well, at least she's not using an iPad. These photo prompts pop up fairly regularly, so by the end of the game you'll have a decent set of photos to document your journey. The Lost Legacy has a phenomenal photo mode, so this initially felt a touch redundant. However, it's great for people like me who are too lazy to open up the photo mode and mess about with filters. Chloe jumps in a vehicle that looks awfully familiar. I'll talk a bit more about that later. We arrive at the entrance to a place called Halibadu, the newer of two capital cities in the Hoysala territory. Halibadu is guarded by Ganesh, while the older capital, Balur, is guarded by Shiva. Chloe mentions that her father was an archaeologist, and you can probably see what these random references to her father are building up to at this point. You use the jeep's winch to open the door, but I guess someone tipped her off that a winch would be more useful than improved suspension. Oh, your brother insisted on getting a 4x4 with a winch. So you sprung for the winch, but you couldn't spring for the suspension. I got it. You then move through a couple of largely uneventful combat encounters. One early surprise in The Lost Legacy was Chloe's attitude to treasure hunting. She's half Indian and is treasure hunting in India. You might expect her to be a touch more sensitive towards the idea of blowing up cultural touchstones and robbing them blind, but apparently not. I'm just surprised is all. I figured you'd be more of a leave no trace type when it comes to Indian roots. Sentimentality in this line of work? Get you killed. She said something similar back in Asar's place. It doesn't bother you. These are all Indian artifacts. It's not my fight. You end the chapter by opening a door and moving through into the Western Ghats. This is the open world style level that you might have heard about. It got a lot of hype both before release and in reviews. Chloe has a map marking a large spire in the middle, which would have been bloody difficult to miss even without the map. You head to the spire, climb to the top and open all the doors. The symbols on the doors correspond to the three different sites you need to visit, and there's a fourth one for a secret location. So what exactly is the big advantage that Chloe and Nadine have over Asav? You could see all these locations from the ground anyway. The symbols don't help much other than identify each site as representing a different Hindu figure. You don't need the key to do that, so it's a little odd that the key is made out to be a big deal here. Asav clearly found the three locations easily enough because he stationed men at each location already. The spire was unmissable from the moment you entered the area and you don't need the key to open the doors at the top. You don't even need to go up the spire because you can access all these locations just fine if you find them yourself. Of the four locations the spire adds to your map, the random location on the map is perhaps the most interesting. When you activate a puzzle, it adds some waypoints to your map that identify 11 hidden coins in the level. One of the coins is right next to you, but the other 10 require you to solve a short puzzle, kill some enemies, or do a bit of light platforming. Nothing here is particularly complicated, but when combined it adds up to a cool little distraction. Puzzles include creating a symbol of a horse by rotating dials and shooting lots of bells in quick succession to open a door. Some coins are vaguely hidden, such as one where you have to use your rope and body weight to reveal a hole in the ground, or swing through a load of fountains before a timer expires. The best one has you walking around a statue of an elephant before realising that there's a hole under the shallow water that you can swim through to get the coin. A couple of the coins are hidden behind generic combat sections, but in one you can sneak into an area and use your lockpick to get the coin without killing everyone. It's a tiny difference, but not having to kill every enemy is a great way to make the game feel like it's giving you options and a reward for being stealthy. Don't get me wrong, none of these puzzles or exploration sections are all that special by themselves, but they are far more satisfying than just seeing a shiny piece of treasure on the ground and picking it up. It'd be great if all the treasures in the Uncharted games had an element of thought put into them like this. My major complaint is that the markings on the map make it far too easy to just drive to the marker and collect the coin. There are already statues that identify the location of the coins, so perhaps these could be made a little more obvious and then the map markers removed. This would be much better for encouraging exploration. Your reward for collecting all these coins is a bracelet that will light up and make a noise when you're near treasure. You can also access this cool area with monkeys, except they strangely disappear when you get close. The bracelet makes it incredibly easy to find treasure, which would be good if the treasure were at all worth collecting. This is definitely an issue that relates to all Uncharted games and not just the Lost Legacy, but I'm going to rant anyway. The treasure collectibles in Uncharted are lazy and a waste of time. They don't contain any information about the item you've just found, nor do they give you any in-game bonuses. I don't particularly need in-game bonuses, but not having information about the piece of treasure you've just found is a wasted opportunity to make people care about the game's collectibles. 
The frustrating part is that it wouldn't require much work to fix. The pieces of treasure are carefully drawn by artists, and I have to assume some research went into creating accurate pieces for the time period. They've done the hard work. How difficult can it be to add in a paragraph or a couple of sentences talking about the item and how it was used? You start with a Ganesh figurine on you and Chloe briefly describes it to the girl in the market. Why not just add that bit of dialogue to the treasure? Honestly, I find this incredibly frustrating because it's one of the only ways the word lazy can accurately describe such an incredible developer as Naughty Dog. Okay, enough ranting about something that isn't important. Let's take a look at the main objective in this area. You can go to the three zones in any order you like. I went to the Shiva area first. Even if you hadn't been to the top of the tower, you would know it's the Shiva area as it's clearly marked up as such with axe carvings. Like I said, the whole rigmarole about going to the top of the tower is largely pointless. You use the jeep's winch to gain access to the area and then move through a brief combat encounter. There's a series of three good puzzles, although I have a minor gripe with the execution. After opening the exit door by stepping on a tile, you have to make your way across the room by jumping on pillars. The first room has one large statue who swings a heavy axe for every three jumps you take. If you happen to be standing on a pillar with a gold marking when the axe is swung, then Chloe is hit and knocked off. The first room is pretty simple. You can't take the shortest route, but so long as you backtrack a couple of times, you'll be okay. The second room introduces a silver statue which slams the axe straight down instead of doing a horizontal swing. The third room is the big test. It's huge, with plenty of gold and silver statues who also rotate with every jump, so it becomes tricky to keep your eye on all of them. It's relatively challenging, but you're unlikely to get stuck because you can always brute force it with trial and error if you need to. The minor niggle I mentioned is 100% a nitpick. I fully recognise that, although it bugged me nonetheless. That's the nature of nitpicks, I guess. When Chloe is standing in the wrong place as the axe swings, she takes a hit and is knocked down to the ground in a near-death state. This looks kind of ridiculous. She's hit by a massive axe. She should be dead. Can't we have an animation here that shows Chloe jumping out of the way or rolling off the pillar? After these puzzles, you finally get a real use for the key. It's used to rotate a dial into the shape of an axe, which opens up one third of a waterfall. Chloe and Nadine have a short conversation slash info dump where we get a brief mention of the Drake brothers, plus a self-referential nod to how Sam came out of nowhere. Nadine tells Chloe that Shoreline was her father's business that he passed on to her and she's determined to win it back. I headed over to the zone with Ganesh's trident next. You don't need to use the winch this time because the area is compromised, but so was the last one, so I don't quite get the distinction. There are more enemies in this one though. You clear out a group of them and then solve an incredibly basic puzzle where you find five buttons. Nadine might even press one of them for you as well, which is a nice touch. You solve another dial puzzle, this time creating a trident. These puzzles get progressively harder, which is quite clever as it does it no matter what order you do the puzzles in. The axe was easy for me, but that might be the hardest one for you. Chloe opens up a little more about her dad. She explains that the tusk is a symbol of Hoysala dominance and would have been a great prize for the Persians who were after the tusk. Chloe's dad was obsessed with the tusk, going on expeditions to find it and spending all his time researching it. He then suddenly sent Chloe and her mum to Australia, claiming that it was too dangerous to stay with him. There's another combat encounter when you leave this area and head back into the open world. I'm referring to this as an open world, but that's a bit of a misnomer. I've got to admit, I don't entirely understand all the praise I've seen heaped on this level. Nearly every review I've read has called it out as special and one of the best parts of the game. I don't get it. Sure, it's technically impressive. The level is relatively large by Uncharted standards, although not by the standards of full open world experiences, of course. I have no doubt that implementing the puzzles and exploration sections into such a large space was a technical challenge, and it's incredible to look at. For the time being, I'll ignore the fact that this area borrows heavily from Uncharted 4's Madagascar levels. It looks gorgeous. It's exactly what I'd expect from Naughty Dog, but it's not fair to take it for granted. Naughty Dog takes a lot of care in making its games visually spectacular, and that's easy to see when you open the photo mode while Chloe is pulling out her map. It's not just an animation. She's looking at the actual map upon which you can spot all the markers and tell which ones you've crossed out. The Lost Legacy is one of the best looking games on the PS4, and being able to drive around a large level like this, splashing through rivers and powering up muddy slopes, doesn't cease to be impressive just because we've seen it once before. Now that I've got all that praise out of the way, let's go through the criticisms. The obvious one has to be that you have very little freedom in what you do in this open world. All you're doing is choosing the order in which you complete the missions. For each of the three main sections, you have to go through one specific door, and as far as I can tell, you can't shoot any enemies before going through that door. You can't scout ahead. You can't approach from a different direction. This level is simply three combat encounters that you can do in any order, plus collecting the coins if you want. I don't find that particularly interesting or game-changing. After completing the game, I went back to this level to experiment a bit more. 
I used the cheats to give myself a sniper rifle, hoping to spot enemies from a distance. As far as I can tell, you can't see any enemies in the three main encounters until you go through the door to start the encounter. Even when there are combat encounters out in the open, the enemies don't spawn in until you get close. In one part of the map, my sniper rifle disappeared from my inventory and the game refused to let me get it back with the cheats. I've no idea why, but I wonder whether it was a deliberate attempt to limit my use of scoped guns that could be used to take enemies out in advance. That's probably not true, it sounds like a bit of a conspiracy theory. But why place an arbitrary restriction on weapons you can use in specific parts of an open world map? The puzzle sections are similar in that you nearly always have to approach them from one set route, except occasionally you can see enemies in advance. But the world feels sterile. There are no animals roaming around, there's typically no threat until you specifically go into combat zones. The enemies here didn't spot the two women running around in the open for ages until I accidentally fired my gun, and then they were all over me with rockets and strangely accurate machine guns. Without a sniper rifle there's not much you can do to take these enemies out in advance because the game wants you to approach this section from the north. This was the only time I ended up in combat without meaning to. It would be great if Naughty Dog moved to open worlds for future Uncharted games, but this isn't the way to do it. Open worlds are supposed to feel alive. This world is deader than a game developer five years after being purchased by EA. The open level gives rise to another problem, and that's the pacing when combined with the chapter before this one. Chapter 3 is almost identical to this time consuming level and should have been cut out entirely to stop this one becoming dull. Except chapter 3 can't be removed because it serves as a tutorial for sneaking around in large arenas, highlighting enemies and taking down large groups. Chapter 4 can't be used to teach the player these tricks because you can choose what order you do the encounters in. Typically game designers gradually introduce new elements of a game and then ramp up the challenge until you have to put everything together in a test of skill. We just saw that in the Shiva puzzle room. That's not the case here. You learn everything in the chapter before and then have to do it at least three times in the next level. The open world in chapter 4 adds to a slow and repetitive feeling in the first third of the game. Rant over, for the time being. The last section for me was Parashurama's bow and arrow. This is largely climbing which means we've had one puzzle dominant section, one combat and one exploration. You use the dial again and open up the third waterfall which means you can now move through into the city of Halabadu. In the dialogue Nadine opens up briefly about her desire to get Shoreline back because it happened on her watch. Chloe opens the door to Halibadu and I have to briefly go back into rant mode again. This is not a complaint specific to the Lost Legacy, but it bugs the hell out of me nonetheless. Chloe and Nadine have travelled around a large open area, killing countless people and solving puzzles to get through a door into a hidden city. Except, well, it's not exactly hidden is it? Asav supposedly couldn't get in here because Chloe stole the key, but he could have just used a helicopter to fly straight in. Uncharted 2 and 3 had this exact same problem, and it's equally glaring here because you walk through a door and immediately see some large statues that you'd be able to see from browsing Google Earth. It makes the entire previous section feel completely unnecessary. There is no way a Sarv would station people at all those outposts when he could just fly straight in. I tried to think up ways to excuse this. Maybe a Sarv had already figured out how to get through and put the men near the dials as a way to tempt Chloe and Nadine into a trap. They even discuss the possibility that Asav is using them to do all the hard work, but as we'll see later that isn't likely the case. Nadine notices that the statues are damaged as if someone tried to force their way inside. This is referring to the Persian army, not Asav and his men. Chloe thinks the king made a mistake in wasting loads of money to build an elaborate city which just made it more tempting to raiders. The next section is a good illustration of how I know my problems with the Lost Legacy are more issues of fatigue with the series as a whole than specific digs at this game. Swinging from your rope is one of the new mechanics introduced in Uncharted 4 and I still find it a lot of fun. What is not fun anymore is climbing from ledge to ledge with no risk of death as you scale large structures. When Chloe reaches the top of this Ganesh statue, the camera pans out in a not so subtle attempt to make you appreciate the view and what you've achieved. I used to enjoy these moments even though they never took any skill. It always made me think about how far games have come that I'm able to climb huge structures and look at the world around me. I know I sound spoiled and entitled, but it's not enough anymore. There needs to be some sort of challenge. Uncharted games are aimed at a wide audience to include those who don't buy many games, perhaps the stereotypical casual gamer, who mainly plays Madden or FIFA and a couple of other games each year. Naughty Dog is scared of putting those players off its games and ensures that you never have any real challenge with climbing. This can work for a game or two, but when you're still doing it five games later you can't blame players for getting bored. People who want to increase or decrease the challenge of combat can do so, but there's not much you can do when the climbing is mind-numbingly easy. I'm getting pretty negative here, but there's some positive stuff to come. This was the low point of the game for me, it's largely up from here on out. Once inside the statue you find lots of old weapons, some of which are Persian, and then eventually the site of a large battle. This is where the Persians fought the Hoi Salar. One particular body is still standing in the same position he died, holding the fort to protect against the onslaught. 
It's surprisingly touching for a few random skeletons and shows the skill Naughty Dog has with its environmental storytelling. The next room has one of the better puzzles in the game. You have to rearrange some shapes so that the shadows line up with the pictures on the wall. You can only shift the shapes from one end to the other, so if you want a piece to stop in the middle then you'll need another one behind it and eventually it gets complicated. The pictures on the wall show Shiva giving his axe to Parashurama who uses it to kill Shiva's son, Ganesh. It's not just that the puzzle is good as a puzzle, it also reinforces the game's story. Chloe uses the key in a dial and expects to get the tusk as her reward. Instead, the floor rises and Nadine and Chloe are taken back out into the open. Chloe quickly figures out what's wrong, but I'm not sure how. It's quite common to move from indoors to outdoors again on these little expeditions. They've done it a few times just in the last hour. Having a platform take them back up to the outside doesn't necessarily mean the tusk isn't here. They might just have to go somewhere else first. Anyway, obviously Chloe is right, I just don't understand how she figures it out so quickly. Halibadu was a decoy. The tusk was never here, it was at Balur all along. The king created Halibadu to trick the Persians, including stationing men here and leaving them to die just so the Persians wouldn't get the tusk. When combined with the comments from Chloe's dad about the tusk being something big, I suspected we might be going down the mystical route again. Thankfully, we're not. There's a decent escape scene as the mechanism approaches the top. Chloe and Nadine sit for a moment and think about their failure until they notice the water now flowing through an aqueduct. They follow it to a building until they come across more of Asav's men. Now, I'm having a lot of trouble figuring out Asav's movements here. I don't believe for one second that he already knew Halibadu was a decoy and that the tusk was at Balur all along, and he never claims that, but somehow he's ahead of Chloe and Nadine. However he got here he managed to bring a massive bloody tank along with him. A couple of them actually. I guess we're not supposed to think too much about this sort of stuff, but part of the thrill of treasure hunting is exploring the unknown, and that is somewhat mitigated when tanks burst through the forest in front of you. You won't be able to defeat the tank right now, so you make your way into a building and are captured by Asav on the way out. Asav is impressed with Chloe for solving the key, even though his own expert spent a week trying to figure it out without any success. So his expert didn't solve the problem, and yet Asav still figured out that he needed to come to Balur. How? He's gone all this way without the key. If we're to believe that the key is crucial, then that means Asav waited for Chloe and Nadine to open the main door to Halibadu and then skipped it to head straight to Balur. But as we'll see later, he does need the key, so he should be focused on capturing Chloe and Nadine. I don't get it. According to Asav, the Hoysalar understood that progress demands sacrifice. They would kill those not prepared to fight, letting their blood run through the city to inspire those that did. I know this is all typical bad guy nonsense, but I like it. Asav is calm and collected and his lines are expertly delivered by Usman Ali. Chloe gets into a fight with Asav. If you haven't played any Uncharted games yet then I'll briefly explain the fistfights. They're quick time events where the quick time prompt sometimes appears up on the screen but not always. Chloe can't take on Asav face to face so you have to time your dodges and get behind him to attack. The dodge timing is a bit tricky because Asav moves slowly. You'll see him pull back his fist and will want to dodge but you have to hold back for just a touch longer than is natural. The idea is to make the fights look good rather than feel good. It's been this way for a while and it's another thing Naughty Dog needs to change for future games. The fight ends when Chloe and Nadine are thrown through a brick wall into the aqueduct. They get taken with the current until Chloe falls and drifts off into unconsciousness for 30 minutes. Chloe quickly recovers and they stumble upon a wheel that reveals a large statue of Nandi, Shiva's gatekeeper. Nandi is guarding a hidden entrance to Balur. Asav and his men are already inside by forcing their way through with C4. Nadine spots Asav's men dragging a man out of the back of a truck. This is Asav's expert, the one who failed to solve the key. Nadine recognises him immediately and so do we. It's Sam Drake, Nathan's brother who popped up in Uncharted 4. Chloe has been working with Sam all along. He went ahead to do recon on the disc, at which point he was presumably caught by Asav and made to work on decoding it. Part of Chloe's motivation for being here is to save Sam, although it's never really felt that way. She's made no mention of wanting to find Sam and has been completely focused on the tusk. It's understandable why she doesn't want to tell Nadine, but if she plans to rescue Sam at some point then Nadine is clearly going to find out. I'm sure the actual answer is that Naughty Dog wanted Sam's appearance to be a surprise and constant references to needing to save someone would potentially ruin that. Still, it's a bit sloppy. Nadine doesn't take too kindly to the news that Chloe is working with Sam because she'd much rather kill him. She punches Chloe and goes off by herself in the vehicle. This drama is a bit pointless as you catch up with Nadine again after one more combat encounter. This encounter might be the best in the game, because for once your goal isn't to take down all the enemies, it's to take out a tank. That might sound like an insignificant distinction, but it changes the way you approach the area. Most encounters have a lot of enemies, and the expectation is that you'll take a few out stealthily before shooting the rest. 
There aren't as many enemies here, but with the tank patrolling the middle, there doesn't need to be. This is also one of the few encounters where taking enemies out from tall grass doesn't feel like you're cheesing the game. You're in the midst of a heavy downpour, so staying hidden is now borderline believable. The heavy rain looks terrible when Chloe stands still, mind you. You take down the tank with C4 or RPGs dotted around the level. Once you've taken it out, reinforcements arrive and Nadine chips in with a punch every now and again. She's surprisingly adverse to using her gun for the former head of a mercenary group. The two of them agree to put their differences to one side, although Nadine makes it clear that she only cares about the tusk, not Sam. They used a hidden entrance to get inside. Asav's forcing his way in by blowing things up. The next scene is blatant emotional manipulation. It serves no purpose other than to give you the feels. I bloody loved it. You come across an elephant who is trapped under some collapsed pillars, likely due to all the explosions going off. You free the elephant and then ride on him for a bit and even feed him some fruit. You can't control the elephant and he doesn't help you get past any obstacles which seems like an odd omission actually. There's literally no point to it other than to give the characters more time to talk and to give the player a nice moment. And yeah, despite that it's great. It does exactly what it's trying to do. Nadine asks Chloe about her father and she opens up. He thought he was onto something big with the tusk and the Ministry of Culture agreed to finance an expedition. Bandits raided his camp and his body was found by local authorities. The little Ganesh figure was sent to Chloe afterwards, so I assume it was found on his body. I'll come back to the story about the dad nearer the end of the video. After some climbing you find the lost city of Balur. It's spectacular and this time it actually is a hidden city that you wouldn't be able to spot with your nephew's toy drone and a pair of AA batteries. Asav has of course gotten ahead of you, so you quickly run into a large group of enemies. This is one of the larger combat encounters in the game, so it's a good time for me to talk about the game's combat system. The Uncharted series has always had stealth takedowns and has always struggled to implement them in a natural way. The museum level in Uncharted 2 stands out as being particularly terrible and was a low point in an otherwise great game. Uncharted 4 fleshed the stealth system out and that's been carried forward to the Lost Legacy. You can now mark enemies which obviously makes it easier to keep an eye on them and you can hide in tall grass to well remain hidden. It's possible to clear entire areas without firing your gun once, although I imagine most people end up shooting at least a third of the enemies per encounter. Stealth is used to thin out the numbers a bit and even the odds. I'm a sucker for stealth in games, but after two Uncharted games with these stealth mechanics I'm starting to think it might have been a bad idea. Or at least, it's bad in its current form. One of my big problems with Uncharted's combat is the way you constantly have to wait behind cover to regain your health. It's almost impossible to avoid taking damage regardless of your skill level because of the game's hit scan weapons. You'll be hit regardless of whether you're running, jumping, rolling or swinging across a cavern. In one of his Uncharted videos, Nova Canoe states that the Uncharted games are more fun on the easier difficulty settings. When I first heard that I did a bit of a double take. I'd just completed Uncharted 4 on the crushing difficulty setting. Uncharted couldn't possibly be more fun on the lower settings because that would have meant I completed it on crushing just for pride and a digital accolade. Unfortunately Nova Canoe is bang on. The difficulty in these games doesn't scale well. There were a few encounters in Uncharted 4 that got frustrating, but the problem isn't strictly the difficulty, it's that it's less fun. The harder the difficulty, the more time you spend waiting behind cover for your health to come back. I was talking about stealth, wasn't I? Okay, so stealth has the same problem. It's all waiting around. You can't make a noise to attract enemies to your location. You can't hide dead bodies. You can't throw stones to make guards investigate. Even Battlefield 1, a first person shooter focused on its multiplayer, had a more developed stealth system. The only way you can influence guards in Uncharted is to kill other guards in a location where enemies will notice the dead bodies, or cheese the game and show yourself for just long enough for the enemy to get suspicious without alerting the other guards. Regardless of whether you choose combat or stealth, you're going to be waiting around a lot, which seems to go against the idea of these games being action movies in video game form. Hiding behind cover or using stealth is fine, like I said, I love stealth games but there aren't enough stealth mechanics to make that satisfying. You're left with gunplay that has barely changed from 2009 and a clumsily implemented stealth system. This encounter shows a lot of the problems. If you wait long enough you can stealth kill quite a few enemies as they approach ledges, either by pulling them down or jumping on them. If you get caught you can easily swing across to another platform where it's quite easy to stay out of sight until the enemies stop looking for you. This isn't how I want to play Uncharted and it seems to me like the increased stealth focus has harmed the pace of the game. There's an implied assumption that you'll stealth kill some enemies before starting combat and I find that boring without actual stealth mechanics to play with. I want to swing around on a rope and kill people in a way that looks ridiculous and impractical, but I'll always take damage and have to go and hide for a few moments. I think Naughty Dog knows these combat encounters are flawed. The encounters aren't particularly long and yet they often have multiple checkpoints that can be triggered by accident. 
Three times I died and restarted at checkpoints that seemed designed to ease the frustration with the encounters and make it almost impossible to fail. Even if you're terrible at combat, you'll eventually memorise the enemy movements and make it through. For example, there's a difficulty spike in this section when a heavily armoured enemy appears with a chain gun that will tear you down if you don't take him out quickly. There's a good chance you'll get torn to shreds by this guy the first time, but don't worry, there's a checkpoint right beforehand that you probably triggered without even knowing. I ended this encounter by picking up the large gun and slaughtering the rest of the enemies in this room and the ones that come through after. You make your way to a large tusk being held aloft by what appears to be the royal family of the Hoi Salah. When Chloe looks closer, she sees that they are protecting the common folk. She then makes a bit of a leap and declares that the desire to protect the tusk wasn't about power, it was about culture. Thing is, there was only ever one vague mention of the tusk being particularly powerful. We were never told Asav was after some insanely powerful relic like the Holy Grail that would grant him immortality. From the beginning, I assumed he was after the tusk because it's worth a lot of money. Were we supposed to think something else? This scene has an epic reveal feel to it, except it's lacking the epic reveal. Nadine notices that there's a gap on the tusk where Chloe's Ganesh figure slots in nicely. Chloe realises her dad was here before her, which I get would be a big deal, but she then mutters something about how he wasn't kidding when he said he was onto something big. Except the whole point is that the tusk isn't something big. Not really. It's exactly what you'd assume it was, a relic of a lost society. Historically important, without a doubt, but not something big beyond what they already thought. Nadine says he kept this from her to keep her safe, but safe from what? They decide they can't let Asav get his hands on the tusk. Again, this feels wrong. It's like the meaning of the tusk got flipped during production of the game. Maybe originally the tusk was supposed to be a normal, albeit valuable, artifact, and then they find out it has hidden power. It makes more sense if Chloe and Nadine thought that they were after a culturally significant artifact and then found out it was powerful. That would explain the sudden need to stop Asav getting to it and her father's desire to keep her safe from the tusk. I'm not saying that they shouldn't go get the tusk now, but I don't get their newfound desire based on this relatively minor reveal. Chloe removes the Ganesh figure again, which for some reason opens a door behind them. It's rare that stealing from a secret temple rewards you with an open door, especially when they only put this figure on the tusk a moment ago. Chloe moves the arms around on a large statue of Ganesh to get water flowing into the middle and open a door. There's then a basic reflection puzzle where you arrange a few mirrors until all the lights are aimed towards the centre. Nadine manages to be vaguely useful here by playing the role of a statue. Ironically, she's been running around all game doing nothing and is finally useful when she stands still. Asav's men show up and you meet up with Sam. Asav forces Chloe to solve the final puzzle for him. Once again, there are images of Shiva giving Parashurama his axe and Parashurama killing Ganesh. However, to reveal the picture in the middle, you have to solve another dial puzzle. The dial puzzle shows Ganesh surrendering to Parashurama because he didn't want his father's axe to look weak. He didn't fight back to protect the reputation of his family. Once Chloe knows this, she adjusts the arms on the Ganesh statue into the surrender position. The puzzle is complete and the tusk is revealed. I liked this section. I'll ignore how easily Asav could have solved the puzzle himself. It builds off the knowledge Chloe and the player has developed throughout the game. You've practiced these disc puzzles a few times and the story of Shiva's axe has been mentioned plenty of times as well. This puzzle is reinforcing the game's main theme and helping ensure that everyone gets the gist of the story even if they aren't paying too much attention. Asav claims the tusk as his reward and goes full James Bond villain by handcuffing the three of them to a railing instead of shooting them. His excuse is that it's bad luck to kill them in a temple, even though he knows they're about to die due to the water that's about to flood in after they blow a hole in the wall. I'm not a religious man, but I doubt the gods would take too kindly to that either. There's another nice touch where all that lockpicking finally comes in use as Chloe is able to get out of her handcuffs. Nadine has to save Sam through more forceful measures. Asav escapes and, oh, by the way, he has a helicopter now. Okay, so we find out soon that it doesn't belong to him, but still, he has access to one and could have just flown into Halabadu in the first place. Sam tells Chloe that he overheard Asav talking about setting up an arms deal, so off they go to get in the way. We now move forward as a threesome and Sam immediately reminds me why I loved him in Uncharted 4. Go ahead. You first. Much obliged. Wow. They quickly end up in a combat encounter thanks to Nadine not having any chill. She said she was a fool. This is another encounter that can be tough if you want to do more than just hide behind cover and take your time. You might think that with Nadine and Sam on your side this encounter would be easy, however Sam is about as useful as Nadine. In other words, he's not. Chloe and Nadine promised not to use crates, but Sam made no such commitment. We get a tedious crate sequence that requires pushing a cart down the tracks, switching the tracks, pushing it again, then pushing it back, switching the tracks again and pushing it back to where you started. I love Sam, but Chloe and Nadine had the right idea. No crates. 
The group find Asav doing his weapons deal and the buyer turns out to be Shoreline, the Dean's old mercenary group which is now led by Orca, her former colleague. Asav uses the tusk to buy something from Shoreline in a large crate. Nadine insists that Shoreline don't typically do arms deals as if that's where they draw the line. It's cool to work for people like Rafe, the villain from Uncharted 4, and be guns for hire without asking any questions, but they'd never do anything like sell guns to other people, that would be going too far. They fire the guns themselves like responsible private mercenaries. Clearly this is part of an attempt to make us sympathise with Nadine. She was the second villain in the previous game and is now shifting to a character we're supposed to like. It's hard for us to like gunrunners, so we have to be told in no uncertain terms that the Dean isn't like that. She's one of the good heads of a private military corporation. They're not all bad, honest. Orca gets on the chopper with the tusk, except instead of leaving he stays behind to clean up. The chopper circles and his men stand around not doing a lot except waiting for you to kill them. You're encouraged to use stealth but you have a secondary mission again, this time taking down the chopper with RPGs in locked crates. It's a similar setup to the tank section but this time there are a lot more enemies. No matter how many of them you take out, shooting the chopper with an RPG results in reinforcements coming out to hunt you down. You have to run around a bit until the game decides that the enemies have lost sight of you and you can go to the next lock crate. I much prefer the rainy, quiet setup of the tank section compared to the packed arena on offer here. It shows up many of the limits with the game's stealth system as well. The enemies don't hunt you for long and then seemingly give up after a cursory check. The only easy way to tell you're now in stealth mode again is to run through long grass. If you don't duck down then the enemies are still looking for you, it's not a satisfying system. The good news is that from this point on the Lost Legacy is nearly all one epic set piece and it's a hell of a lot of fun. Chloe runs out of weapons to take down the helicopter so she uses her rope to get up there instead. There's a quick time event inside the helicopter until it crashes and Nadine confronts Orca. Sam saves her life this time so I guess they're even. Once Orca is dead, Chloe discovers what Asaf bought for the tusk. A bomb. It's on a train and it's heading for a city where it will blow up in a huge demonstration of power for Asav in his attempt to overthrow the government. Chloe immediately decides she's going after the bomb but Sam and Nadine are reluctant. Their reactions don't mesh well with their characters. Sam certainly isn't a saint but the way he callously suggests they walk away with the treasure doesn't quite fit for me. The whole point of Nadine's character arc has been to show her change from a robot to a human being. Why have her act so selfishly now after all that effort to show her changing? It wasn't long ago we had a scene where Nadine and Chloe decided they had to get to the tusk before Asav because of its cultural importance. It would be a bit inconsistent for Nadine to care about getting the tusk back to preserve a dead culture's history, but not care about a bomb heading towards a city full of people who are still alive. They changed their minds almost instantly so I guess it doesn't really matter. It just makes their initial reluctance all the more pointless. Anyway, the end result of all this is possibly the best set piece in all of the Uncharted franchise. The chase scene starts in the jeep as you take out enemies on bikes while heading towards the train. You jump on board and yeah, we have a set piece on the train. Let's quickly knock out the obvious. A set piece on a train was famously done in Uncharted 2. Issues of unoriginality aside, I think this one is better. There's more variety in what you do and how you move from one end of the train to the other. You can use your rope to swing between carts and choose whether to go through the carriage or above it. A few times you have to jump off the train into vehicles to get past obstacles like tankers before jumping back onto the train again, or you can jump onto turrets and use them to your advantage. You did some of this in Uncharted 2 but it never felt this smooth. This scene is also a great example of how much more fun the game could be on the lower difficulty levels. On hard or even normal you will spend a lot of time looking at a grey screen waiting for your health to refill, whereas on the lower levels you can hang there on ropes shooting guys on bikes. On the higher difficulty settings I died a fair few times and while it never became difficult the flow would be completely ruined on each death. Even if you're a trophy whore like myself I recommend going back to this level and playing on a lower setting just to experience playing it all through in one go. It's exhilarating. In case you're interested if you don't progress forwards the train will continue moving and looping around the same bit of scenery. Eventually you find the bomb but neither Chloe nor Nadine is particularly skilled at bomb disposal so there isn't much they can do about it. They want to stop the train but the engine room is locked up. The only option left is to switch the track so that the train heads away from the city and towards a broken bridge. Chloe jumps back into a car and drives towards the station but Nadine has to stay behind on the train. You meet up with Sam on the way and together you fend off enemies before switching the tracks just in time. I know this is all heavily choreographed but like a good movie so long as the direction is on point you won't care. If you don't switch the tracks on time the screen just fades to black and you quickly restart. It's a bit disappointing, I'd have liked to have seen a quick shot of the city being blown up. The train moves so slowly at this point that most people won't fail so Naughty Dog probably decided it wasn't worth the hassle. 
Chloe wants to save Nadine, so she jumps back into the car and sends it flying into the train. I don't want to understate how cool this feels to pull off, even though it requires very little skill. I tried to break this scene, but it's tough to fail unless you actually stop. If you miss the first ramp, you get plenty more chances. If you slow down, then the train slows down as well. Even if you keep missing the ramps, there's one at the end that it's impossible not to go off and that will spring you into the train no matter how slowly you're going. It's quite clever how natural this is made to look even when you're trying to mess it up. You catch up with Asav and fight him alongside Nadine. Asav throws off his glasses, which is a nice little nod to an earlier moment when Nadine guessed that the glasses were just for show. That's exactly what he wants. Pretty sure his glasses are an affectation. To make him look harmless or smart, both. <laughs> There's another fight scene which is no more fun than the last one. These desperately need to be reworked. Asav claims that Chloe's efforts are pointless because he'll just buy another bomb. If he has the funds to buy more bombs, and he probably does judging by all the treasures in his office, then why go to the effort of getting the tusk in the first place? No matter how good you are at mashing buttons, Asav throws you off the side of the train where you have to move quickly to avoid getting knocked off. This section bugged me a bit. There are red signs on the side that you're supposed to move up and down to avoid, but they're tough to pick out against the red part of the train that they crash into just before reaching you. I can't pretend it's all that tough, but it might catch you out once, and it's another death that spoils the momentum. The really annoying bit is that you can't avoid being hit by one of the signs, but the game decides it's okay this time because you're supposed to move into another cutscene. Chloe and Nadine take his half down together, and he gets trapped under the bomb. They escape just as the train is about to speed off the broken bridge and get a helping hand from Sam along the way. Stop climbing, please. Jesus. Oh, Sam. I right, climb up. I got you. Nadine redeems herself somewhat with a perfectly timed rebuff to Sam. Know of any selfish dickheads who might be in need of a partner? Right. Not you. Okay. Chloe and Nadine decide to give the tusk to the Ministry of Culture, which is what Chloe's father originally wanted to do before he died. They'll get a finder's fee, but it won't be a big payday. Sam assumes they're joking, and I'll let this scene plus the post-credit scene play out because it's quite good. Elbow. Mm. <laughs> you guys are hilarious. <laughs> Ministry of Culture. Oh my God, you're serious. Mm -hmm. I got it. Private collector. Huh? Just hear me out for a second. I, I, I understand taking the moral high ground, and that's great. It really is. I am completely on board for that. But if we could just don't ruin the moment. <sighs> the entire ending chapter was phenomenal and up there with the best moments in the Uncharted series. It's a good job too because the first half of the game was surprisingly mediocre. Now that we've seen the entire game we'll see how it fits in with that chart I showed at the beginning of the video. Let's start with the characters. Chloe is a perfect substitute for Nathan Drake. Whether she's too similar to Nate is debatable. They're both sarcastic, but Chloe seems more willing to open up about her past and motivations. I loved this character in Uncharted 2, I wanted more of her in Uncharted 3, and I was gutted when she wasn't in Uncharted 4. If Naughty Dog or another developer wants to continue the Uncharted story with Chloe, then they will hear zero complaints from me. Now Nadine. That's more complicated. She starts the game as the same dreadful character she was in Uncharted 4, but by the end of the game I actually liked her. I don't want to play an entire game as Nadine, especially since all she does is point out enemies, it wouldn't be all that exciting. However, as a sidekick, she's not all that bad. I'd prefer Chloe to be accompanied by Sam, or Sully, or Elena, or Nate, or Cutter, or Chloe's friend from her teenage years that slept with her boyfriend and they had a huge fight but then they met in a bar and rekindled their friendship over a beer while they badmouthed the loser guy who ended up cheating on both of them. But I'd pick Nadine over Lazarevich, and that's an improvement on my previous opinion of her. Nadine has a clear character arc, and that's fairly rare in Uncharted games. That said, I think the arc was forced on Naughty Dog by the character they created in Uncharted 4. They were stuck with one of the least interesting characters in the series and had to find something to do with her. I'm convinced Nadine would have been different in 4 if the developers knew she would be a lead in this game. She was a robot in Uncharted 4 and at the beginning of The Lost Legacy. The way she corrects Chloe about bats and catapults would be labelled mansplaining if she were a guy. 
it's painful to listen to, even if the trebuchet thing may be a meme reference. I expected Nadine's character arc to consist of Chloe teaching her to smile and then learning a touching thumbs up sign by the end of the game. Instead, she becomes likeable. There's a sense of humour and a personality. I'm disappointed Nadine didn't do more during gameplay. This could be an unfair criticism when comparing The Lost Legacy to Uncharted 4 because Sam and Sully weren't all that useful there either. However, Naughty Dog clearly made an effort to convince players that Nadine would be useful. Reviews of the game also describe Nadine as a helpful sidekick. One of the vertical slices of gameplay doing the rounds in presentations and on YouTube before release showed Nadine leaping from the grass and taking down two guys by herself. I must have seen this six or seven times before I played the game and it seems designed to make people think Nadine is more useful than she ends up being. In incredibly limited circumstances she will take enemies down for you and she points out enemies that you might not have seen. That's it. Asav isn't too bad as villains go. He has a pre-existing relationship with Nadine although it's not explored much. A few flashbacks where you play as Nadine akin to the prison breakout sequence in Uncharted 4 would have been welcome. The short runtime doesn't give much scope to explore his political motivations either but the opening chapters do a good job of showing not telling how dangerous he is. Having a goal beyond just acquiring a powerful or pricey artifact makes him feel like a human being instead of a cartoon villain. Given the time we had with him I'd say Naughty Dog did a good job with this one. Sam is as awesome as ever except for the fact that his introduction means we have to deal with crates again. He doesn't get many lines but he makes the most of them. On to the story. It was pretty good for such a short adventure. The tale of Ganesh's tusk is mentioned in some of the first moments of the game and the story never loses that focus even with the introduction of Sam. It's woven into the open world locations and plays a part in many of the puzzles. I usually have to force myself to pay attention to the mythological elements of the stories in Uncharted games but here it's hard not to follow it. It's one thing to miss random snippets of conversation when climbing a mountain but it's a lot harder to miss when you simultaneously reveal the story as you solve the puzzles. My only minor complaint relating to the Ganesh story is that Chloe should have already known he surrendered because I believe it's a fairly widespread version of events. I'm also a fan of the two father daughter relationships that initially motivate both of the characters on their journeys. Chloe closes the book on the artifact that her dad was obsessed with until the day he died and Nadine realises her father's legacy might not be worth protecting after all. Speaking of Chloe's dad there's a pretty good chance he's alive. His body was found by local authorities which sounds vague enough that there could have been a case of mistaken identity. He might have gone into hiding and sent the Ganesh figure to Chloe as a clue. It seems like the perfect setup for a sequel. I do have some nitpicks though. I know, surprise surprise right? First I'm not convinced about the rationale for Chloe hiring Nadine in the first place. They barely knew each other at the start. How did they find each other and develop a relationship that was strong enough to go on an expedition like this together? Do treasure hunters have their own version of Tinder for this kind of thing? Chloe hired Nadine because of her relationship to Asav and because she knew Nadine would need the money. However, it would have made more sense for her to go with Sam instead of a complete stranger. And didn't she suspect there might be some tension between Nadine and Sam? Chloe has teamed up with dubious characters in the past so I guess it's not a huge stretch. Maybe it's just my initial anti-Nadine bias showing but there's another pairing I would have preferred. It might prove a bit controversial. I'd still like to play as Chloe but instead of Nadine let's have Chloe initially working alone. She settled down a few years ago and now has a normal office job. She has a boyfriend or girlfriend if you prefer and treasure hunting is in the past. She then gets a tip off from Sam about the tusk and memories of her father's obsession come flooding back. She organises a trip to India with her other half pretending that it's just for a holiday. While there she goes to the market and takes the chance to break into Asav's office in much the same way it played out in the main game. The boyfriend then finds out what Chloe is up to later in the game, they have a fight and eventually reunite. He can then be the sidekick that tags along without doing much except that will make sense as he's an accountant or something like that. This is a touch similar to Nate and Elena's story in Uncharted 4 but the boyfriend won't know anything about Chloe's past as a treasure hunter. The main point of controversy will no doubt be replacing a female character with a male one in one of the few games that stars two women. However in this proposal you have a woman as the star who does all the hard work and a guy who is effectively just tagging along for the ride. The reversal of gender norms should still be interesting. Or you can just give Chloe a girlfriend if you prefer. I've never seen it confirmed that she's straight. My other minor issue is how Chloe's motivation to get the tusk seems to switch around drastically. For most of the game we assume she's after the tusk partly for money and partly because it was important to her father. We then find out that she's also trying to save Sam which has been crammed in a touch unnaturally but I can live with it. The weird part is Chloe's switch from not caring about Indian culture and the treasures to giving the tusk back to the Ministry of Culture in exchange for a small finder's fee. It'd be easy to credit this change of heart to the revelation that her father was close to getting the tusk but she kind of knew that already. Alright she didn't know he was so close but she knew he was after it and working for the Ministry of Culture. Then there's all the stuff about her father trying to keep her safe even though there was nothing inherently dangerous to protect her from. 
Or maybe it was the discovery that the tusk was important to the Hoysalar culture. But why would that prompt a change of heart? Surely she already knew she was going after a culturally important artifact. What did she think it was? Something dangerous? A child's toy? If you blitz through the story in six hours and then put it down without thinking about it too much, you'll probably come away fairly positive. However, the cracks start to show if you dig into character motivations or how the hell a Sav got ahead of Chloe at the end. Now for exploration. Mechanically, it works the same as before. Chloe has no new abilities and moves exactly the same as Nate. You'll still spend plenty of time holding up and pressing X. The only time it gets interesting is when you're swinging on ropes and even that lacks skill. It's not mechanically worse than Uncharted 4, but I'm giving it slightly lower marks because the lack of new environments makes everything feel even more familiar than it already did. You spend nearly all your time climbing environments that you might feel you've climbed somewhere before. I'm honestly now at a stage where I find the climbing flat out boring. I'm fed up with it and don't take much pleasure from it. The spectacular views are wasted on me because I didn't do anything special to get up there. The game rewards you with filmic shots of cameras panning out and circling around the characters, but I haven't earned the reward. It's a participation trophy and I got enough of them as a kid. And finally the combat. I won't repeat everything I've said previously. It's not technically any worse than the combat in Uncharted 4, however it is stale. The stealth slows the game down in a way that isn't fun due to the lack of stealth options, and the gunplay is the same as it's always been. The only difference of note is that you can occasionally find a silenced pistol to help with stealth kills. If you haven't played all the Uncharted games, or perhaps only played them once like a normal person, then this may not be such an issue for you. However, for me, it's now painful. I don't enjoy it anymore. That's partly because I played Uncharted 4 about three and a half times, but it doesn't change the conclusion. It needs to change drastically. A proper melee combat system would be a good start. A health system like Doom's might also work, where you get rewarded with health packs for killing enemies. This could either complement or replace the cover system. I'd like to see enemies miss more shots when you're moving to encourage you to run and gun a bit more. I don't want to spend any more time staring at a grey screen while hiding behind cover. I want the combat in Uncharted to change. A lot. The last thing I want to discuss is the value proposition in The Lost Legacy and how that factored into my review. The short answer is that it didn't, but I should probably elaborate. The Lost Legacy costs $40 on release and does not require Uncharted 4 to play. I believe it was initially going to be $30 and require the main game. The scale of the project increased, so it was priced at $40 and made a standalone product. The Lost Legacy also includes Uncharted 4's multiplayer. So it's a 7 hour game with a multiplayer for $40. You might be able to get 8 hours from the single player if you go for all the treasures. For comparison, Uncharted 4 cost $60 for a roughly 15 hour game with multiplayer. Now I'd argue that both games had padded stories. You could easily chop an hour from The Lost Legacy and 3 hours from Uncharted 4 to leave you with a 6 hour and 12 hour game respectively. Either way you look at it, The Lost Legacy has about half the content of Uncharted 4 depending on how much you value the multiplayer. In my case, I don't at all, but you may enjoy it. From that incredibly basic analysis, $30 might have been a better price, but $40 is hardly out of the realm of possibility. However, there's much more to it than that. Uncharted 4 had a lot of environments. An auction in Italy, a church in Scotland, an open space in Madagascar, a prison escape in Panama, etc. In The Lost Legacy, you spend nearly all your time in a location that looks a hell of a lot like Madagascar. You're even doing the same things, driving around in a very familiar looking vehicle and using a winch in highly contrived circumstances. With all that said, I don't think $40 is great value, but it's not factored into my review. I rarely take price into account unless it's particularly egregious. I care about price when buying games, but everyone has a different sensitivity to it. One of my favourite games this year is What Remains of Edith Finch, but at $20 I find it hard to recommend without warning people that it's short. I still rave about the experience, mind you. Likewise, at $40, I can't wholeheartedly endorse The Lost Legacy, despite scoring it at a 4 out of 5. If you've not played any Uncharted games, then the remastered trilogy or Uncharted 4 are much better value at this point. I've seen reviewers accused of being too harsh on The Lost Legacy and not properly reviewing it as a piece of DLC, but that's not an argument I can get behind. The reduced price point takes the edge off the shorter length of the main story, which would otherwise have been an issue, but it's still $40. It still demands 7 hours of your time, plus whatever you're prepared to put into repeat playthroughs. It's a full game by an experienced developer. It doesn't need a free pass just because it costs $20 less on release. I'm not usually this negative about games I'm giving 4 out of 5. It's a score I reserve for games that I've really enjoyed and strongly recommend to others. The review score guide on my website describes 4 out of 5 games as brilliant. 
I enjoyed The Lost Legacy a lot, eventually, and I do recommend it to others, assuming the cost isn't a deal breaker. But I can't deny that I found it difficult to separate my feelings for this game from my overall fatigue towards the series as a whole. A series that I love, incidentally, just not as much as I used to. I played Uncharted 4 through to completion three times and replayed other chapters to get trophies. I won't be doing that with The Lost Legacy. I've played some of it on Crushing, but I won't be completing that playthrough. I just can't bring myself to do it. I can't play through the entirety of this game again. I can't keep replaying the combat encounters and hiding behind cover until the colour has come back to the screen. I'm done, both with the game and with the franchise in its current form. With this critique, I've tried to find a balance between fairly assessing the game for what it is and not excessively punishing it for a lack of innovation. I did consider a 3 out of 5, but decided that would have been petty. Okay. It would have been a protest vote of sorts. The Lost Legacy isn't a 3, in my opinion. It's a good game, and the second half is particularly strong, containing probably the best set piece I've played in an Uncharted game, or any game for that matter. I just can't shake the feeling that these games need to change, particularly with regards to the combat and exploration. If they don't, well, I probably won't be a day one purchaser of Uncharted 5, and that will make me sad. If you enjoyed the video, hitting the like button would be really helpful, as would sharing if you're so inclined. I do read all the comments and reply to as many as possible, so feel free to let me know your thoughts on the video. It also helps me out with YouTube's algorithms for what that's worth. If you want to see more videos like this, then consider subscribing and hitting the bell icon, which will send you a notification when I post a new video. I'm not sure what the next one will be. I hope to review The Evil Within 2, and I'm also playing Persona 5, but that's taking forever. I feel like I've been mentioning this game at the end of every video since I started this series. Feel free to drop suggestions in the comments or get in touch on Twitter. I try to reply to YouTube comments, but the comment system here gets real messy when you try to have a conversation. Twitter can be a bit easier. Plus, the more followers I get on there, the more likely it is I'll get review copies of games one day, which would help me get videos out sooner. Plus, it boosts my ego. I'm a fragile man. Okay, that's it for me today. Hope you enjoyed the video. Cheers.